Good afternoon and welcome to the FileMaker Academy webinar, Tips on Building Dashboards in FileMaker 14. Our instructor today will be John Mathewson, and I am Tim Newdecker, your moderator. FileMaker Academy is a consortium of eight FileMaker Platinum Level FBA members who are trying to bring education and standards to the FileMaker community with free lessons and webinars. All of these webinars, although presented live, are also available on our YouTube channel, FM Academy. Keyologic, today's presenting company, was founded in 2002. We are a FileMaker Platinum company. We support the Northeast Corridor from New York all the way to Boston. We specialize in FileMaker Pro development and integration. We are now offering training services. We provide cloud hosting and we sell FileMaker licenses to help support our customers. Our presenter today is John Mathewson. I'm going to hand the mic off to him now as we learn about building dashboards in FileMaker Pro. John? Thanks, Tim. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'd like to present today um, in really two different sections. One, I'm going to talk about key performance indicators and using dashboards as a way to look at those. And I'm also going to cover several examples of using FileMaker tools to drill into data and analyze different business situations. Um, I have an interest that goes back for quite a long time in, in this whole subject. Um, it started in the, in the 90s, early 90s, when we ran, it, ran an ad agency, and we embraced the total quality movement, which ultimately became Six Sigma. And we were really good at establishing key performance indicators, which are, are tools that we we would use to analyze the business. One of our big challenges was getting at all the data. Um, we had all this information being stored and placed around the organization, but how do we actually get to visualize it and see it? And that's always been an interest for me. Um, I was very much inspired at DevCon where I saw a speaker, Luke Rochester, um, who uh, spoke on the subject of business intelligence. And um, Luke was um, has been at it for 20 some years and, and gave two presentations which were very much inspiring to me and led to my wanting to do this presentation today. So our, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about KPIs and dashboards. Um, we're going to talk about data warehouses, what they are and why they're important. We're going to use three examples of using FileMaker to look at information. One is going to be creating a pivot table dynamic pivot table where we can actually change the characteristics of the table dynamically. Uh, we're also going to look at creating linked navigation from a dashboard to our underlying data for the purposes of analytics. And we're also going to look at creating trend lines. We're going to look at, at, at things like how can we predict a little bit ahead of today's information uh, to see what might be coming down the path. And um, at the end, we're going to share some additional information, including some interesting work that Luke is doing that I want to share with you. So why does business intelligence matter? Um, and I, I think it really is about the what they call the new knowledge worker, or some people call it the new agile worker. Um, and the idea behind it is that we want to get people spending more time using data than preparing it. Um, historically, and certainly we see it in, in companies we've dealt with, where people are spending tremendous amounts of time having to prepare information for meetings and other uh, purposes, um, and, and that really cuts into their ability to actually start working with the data and, and problem solving. Problem solving is actually the most difficult part of the process, and it's really important that we have time for creativity, and importantly as well, moving from superficial information to sort of underlying root cause so that we can get rid of problems once and for all, as opposed to having them solved on a kind of temporary basis and then uh, recurring after that. If you look at the graph on the right-hand side, you sort of see that this process goes from through three stages, starting with descriptive information. In other words, it might be looking at reports, what are our sales, what are our uh, pieces of information. Moving then into analytic information, which is where we might be looking at the various things that are happening and trying to understand some uh, integration between different pieces of information to understand kind of some causes. And then moving ultimately towards trending, which is talking about future and how does that impact us. 
So when we talk about KPIs, there's a few tips, and, and I want to point out that um, this is something that there are people who spend their entire lives working on this, so that I'm just giving you a very much of a top-line overview, uh, but it's based on stuff I've learned and also some of the experience we had working with the, the total quality and Six Sigma processes. Um, one of the questions that people often ask is, what makes up a good KPI? And I'm going to speak to that a little bit. Um, one of the things that people say is a great benchmark would be, okay, if you go away from your department, your company, whatever your role might be, and you went away for a couple of weeks, what would be the things that you'd want to know about so that you rested easily at night? There's nothing worse than going on vacation and not feeling like you are confident that, that things are going well back at home. So what sorts of things would, would you want to know about? Um, and really there's two components to that and, and one of them is about relevance. In other words, is it relevant to people? Is it something that actually will make a difference to behavior in the organization? And also is it important? Like if we change the behavior, is it going to really make a difference? And so what we're trying to do with KPIs is find those things that are both relevant and important to your organization. So three things to know about. First of all, KPIs must be measurable. You must be able to say, I can measure the outcome that I'm trying to look at. I must have a numeric number that I can go grab. So that's some of the difficulties is some of the things we're trying to accomplish in businesses. It may be hard to find the actual number, but it's extremely important. The second thing is that you should have a clear target. So it might be a target such as we want to reduce returns or we want to improve our uh, effective rate of our of our development staff. It could be a whole host of different things, but it should be in language that's meaningful and relevant and not in high business prose. Um, we want to have it really be something that people can relate to. And then finally we should focus on gaps and that typically is simply a measure between what are we trying to do, what's our target, and what are we actually doing, which is our actual measure, and that means our gap. Something to be aware of is that most attempts at business analytics fail. Uh, Gartner claims that about 80% of attempts in businesses fail. And the reason is, is that people don't get buy-in. And recognizing that most things that do fail in organizations are, are people-based, uh, meaning that it's really important that you have uh, KPIs that really are valuable to your whole organization. Uh, a term we learned from a, a company, uh, we were benchmarking and we learned a company from a company uh, was put all your wood behind a few arrows and the idea behind this is it's really beneficial to set one or two or three goals for the company as a whole and then look at how each person in each area can contribute to that goal. So a great KPI is something that has a broad overall um, purpose to it and then can be specifically applied to individual areas in the company. And dashboards become a very important tool for seeing that because you want that information to be real time, not delayed and hard to find and spending our whole time putting the information together. What we really want to be doing is seeing the information pretty well instantly and then having time to take action and solve issues and realize opportunities. So we're going to get a little bit now into some uh, talk, talking about how some FileMaker provides us some very good tools for cr creating dashboards. And um, again, this portion of what we're going to talk about is going to be a little bit more tool oriented and less uh, KPI oriented, although I hope to tie the two together as best I can. Um, I do want to point out that there was an excellent presentation uh, done, at, it was actually our very first FileMaker Academy, it's one of the best attended, I think there are about 70,000 people have viewed the page, um, and it was how to create dashboards with FileMaker Pro, and that was back in I think FileMaker 11, and it was before we had some of the nice new tools that we have in FileMaker 14, and some of those tools that are great are one of them is Execute SQL, which we'll be talking a lot about. Um, the second one is our improved graphing engine, which allows us to do some really cool things, especially uh, using Execute SQL. And the third thing, which is really more of a technique, which is this idea of processing in place. Um, we recently hosted the, the, the master class with Ray Culligan, from, who came up from Australia, it was really excellent. And one of the things he was showing us was a number of techniques for doing processing in place, which means that we're not jumping around from layout to layout to make things happen. Um, and this is a technique that's very well suited for using dashboards, which can be placed pretty well anywhere in your application, 
um, and uh, rely mainly on global fields and SQL so you're not having to jump around to gather your information. And speaking of gathering information, I'd like to talk briefly about data warehouses. Uh, data warehouses, uh, there's a sample shown on the right there, is basically one table. And in the table, we have two things we're looking for. We're looking for our dimensions and our elements. And our dimensions end up by being the columns. And you can see that we can group columns that may describe certain elements about our business. And then the elements of our business are um, in the actual repeating information within the uh, columns themselves. And through those two things and using Execute SQL, we can do a tremendous amount of an analytics um, based on this very simple structure. A couple of things to be aware of is that you want your information to be normalized, which means that your data is consistent record to record, and also you don't want to have any gaps. Uh, gaps can cause uh, all sorts of problems. So basically, one of the rules of data warehouses is that if, if it's not clean, complete data, then it doesn't make it into the data warehouse. Another thing to think about is that data warehouses are very useful not only for summarizing, say, an entire FileMaker system, but also for summarizing systems such as enterprise databases where you can get a data dump, which can be the content of your uh, data warehouse, and then use FileMaker to analyze it and work with it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about creating pivot table. And this was definitely inspired by Luke Rochester. Um, I've used a little bit different techniques than he did, but I've tried to follow the same basic idea. And what we're going to do is convert warehouse data dynamically into graphs and tables. And it gives us an interactive way to mine into our data. Um, it allows us to select our different X and Y coordinates. And it is completely... Um, processing in place. In other words, it can be placed anywhere in your in your application. And for those of you up on the selector connector, this is the type of thing where you could easily have connections to it from anywhere in your application um, and place it uh, conveniently where the data can be used most effectively. Before we go there, though, I want to talk about Execute SQL. Uh, for those of you who have um, a familiarity with it, I won't spend a lot of time on it, um, but one of the things that is very useful about SQL is it has the ability to group data and also find unique values. And so this first statement, which is select distinct colors for mercury sales, um, the distinct keyword allows us to say, show me only one color. So a color like black might appear 100 times in my list of data, but I only want to get one value for it. And that becomes extremely useful when we're trying to set up pivot tables and other types of information like that. Um, something to be aware of, again, with the processing in place, is that Execute SQL does not require you to build structure. You just have to have the table on your, on your file. And um, it also, to be, to be aware that it returns your data to a variable or field, which you can then process in a number of ways. And, and I'm sure you're aware of many techniques that people are using. So let's take a look at some examples. So this is a, 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 a fictitious company, um, and this is uh, using FileMaker 14. And what we have here is a very simple system, um, and everything on this page is being driven by one script, uh, which I'll show you. Um, the script is, I, I should actually point out that when I say everything, there's, there's actually two scripts. There's one that allows me to select my buttons and highlight which one has been selected. But the rest of it about selecting all the data is all just one script, and it's all driven off of Execute SQL. Um, so what, let, let's take a little bit to show. First of all, I've got the ability to select different years. Um, I'm going to stay on 2015 because th this is all test data, um, and, and I actually have some holes in my 2013 data and 14 data, and I don't want to bump into those. So I'm just going to stay on 2015 where I know the data is cleaner. <laughs> um, and I'm also going to show you that we have the choice of selecting sales, profits, or returns. And again, uh, when, we were, when we were getting ready, Tim sort of said, well, you're not really talking about KPIs here. And I want to point out that essentially I'm making the assumption that these are some of the measures that people want to do in, under KPIs. It's very difficult with test somewhat random data uh, to come up with real examples of drilling into KPIs. Um, so be aware that I'm really talking about the tool, but my intent is that you would be applying this tool to, K to real KPIs in your organization. So uh, what, how this uh, works here is I can select my uh, different categories, and these will show up on the left-hand side. 
of my table down at the bottom. So if I select my sizes, it automatically does my sizes, selects them, and I can then point to them. So now I've got a fresh data warehouse um, uh, tabular data. Um, it shows me my sizes, and it now represents um, my sizes in the graph. So um, I can sort of see this is my 0.5 of an inch. This is my mar. Uh, by the way, these are marbles. I forgot to say that. Um, and I can see my sales for the for that for 2015. 2015. I can see my profit numbers. I can also see my returns. So I have that ability to to drill into my data instantly. I can also compare different pieces of information. Um, and again, this is all being driven. I can change my uh, my 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 cross tab essentially from say months to categories and when it refreshes you see that now I can see my sizes I can also see what the cross tab different categories of marbles that we sell and you can sort of imagine from this that we could start to do all sorts of analytics about how things are selling what returns there are etc which could probably lead us to some valuable information about problem areas uh, things like that, areas where profitability was low, for example. So how does this work? The, the actual behind the scenes here is built upon a, really a single script and it's called populate the pivot table and essentially, I'll just do this, and so what, what happens here, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but I, I like to always say go to the correct layout just to make sure that I'm on it, but no, you always always would be in this case. Um, and then what it does, it populates a variable um, that give me my Y labels, which are basically populating the vertical over here. And it also gives me my X labels. So those are pretty simple. And you'll notice that it's a select distinct. Um, it allows the input to be brought in from the keyboard. And then Mercury Sales is the name of my data warehouse. And all I'm doing is I'm setting it to equal a specific year because I have multiple year data in there. Um, I'm doing exactly the same thing for my X, and that essentially provides me with my cross tab. So that's, that provides that data. Very, very simple, executes almost uh, instantaneously. Now, a technique that is very valuable to know about is in both cases, I'm recording the number of values that I found. And I'm storing that, and I'm using that information to drive the relationships that show this. So for example, you'll notice that I don't have any data that extends past the columns that are in use nor the rows that are in use and this is essentially a portal in the background. And how I'm doing that is I'm actually saying give me a relationship which says that my row number is less than or equal to the number of items I have in my data. This allows me to repopulate this table down here without having to um, delete and replace records, which is something that is, that is not really good for a file over time to, to do massive deletions and, and creations. So what this allows us to do is to repurpose and reuse stuff. It also uses the magic creation trick. Uh, which I'm not going to go into, um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, uh, it'll actually be in the demo file, um, but it allows us to set up a relationship in such a way that if I try and put values into my, um, into my data uh, warehouse summary data and there is no record, it will automatically create a record. So we have this dynamic capability right within this one script to either read data and write to an existing record or to uh, create new data. And again, this is all without having to jump to new layouts or, or, or lose our focus on this particular place. Um, so then we go through and we build our, our X data. It's simply just a loop and it simply populates the screen. Now, one difference that I made with, uh, with Luke, uh, Luke had this all being done with repeating fields and calculations. Um, I decided for reasons of hiding um, and also for a certain amount of performance that I decided to do this. Um, so all of these are dynamic fields that are being populated. So this, this, uh, these loops here do nothing more than, than handle that. Um, and then it comes in and it builds our, our, our rows. It uh, starts off by building my labels and populating those, and this is the actual technique that has the magic. If you notice, there's a VLCR, which means auto-create, and when I populate this, it auto-creates the record if it's missing, or it selects the record if it exists. And that's a technique that is being widely used in the selector connector. Um, same thing then, as we come down, we start to uh, populate our pivot values, and then we come in here and we select each row, 
and we do a select for each row, and then we simply do nothing more than populate the row into the into the into the uh, into the fields uh, that are available, and and also very importantly, we stop the process when there's nothing, and then we use the hide data to suppress any information that ends up by being empty at the end of this process. So one of the things about this loop is it actually goes through all 12 of the of the uh, fields so that it makes them blank and therefore hides them. And then down here is really just some housekeeping. It, it simply does a, a perform script. It, it, it clears the graph line. Um, it clears these graph lines if the, if the, if the nature of these, um, uh, the Y values essentially change. So that's just it. And that's the whole script. That's everything, does, does everything in front of you. So um, another thing to be aware of is actually building the graphing engine part of this. I'm going to go back to months just for fun. And here's my months by size. And if we go into the graphing engine, um, which is just a wonderful tool, it doesn't have everything, but it's got a tremendous amount of power. Um, one of the very important things, if you want to do any processing in place, you must set this to the current record delimited data. And what this means is that we're getting our data from SQL statements, not from related information or from the found set of records. So that's a very important setting and nothing will work if this is not set correctly. Um, the styles component is really just all to do with visuals. Um, and then the chart component is really where we're able now to have various dynamic titles such as looking at what year it is and, and, and what type of dashboard we're looking at, is it return, sales, etc. Uh, we've selected it as a line chart. Um, and then we have various uh, kinds of dynamic creation of titles on the side, etc. Uh, and at the bottom as well, which are dynamically created. And then here is the most important part, which is actually our data sets. And essentially, um, what's happening is when we uh, click on one of these buttons, what we're doing is we're populating a global with the value of the button. So for example, um, if this were, say, 0.5 of an inch, we're populating a global, number one in this case, with 0.5 of an inch. And so for each of the buttons, there is an SQL statement that executes. And here's our data come into our calculation, and we have nothing more than a dynamic tool that builds an SQL statement. Really, that's, that's all that's happening here. And um, so what, I'm not going to go through this in great detail because I'll have everyone falling asleep. Um, but one of the key things is that it only finds the data if the show line is true, and that's controlled by the button. And that's how we're telling the graphing engine to either show or not show. If this is empty, then the, the execute SQL returns no data and the line gets suppressed, as does the legend. And that's all handled automatically. So essentially, that's, that's the bottom line of it. So as you can see, there's, there, uh, for those of you who are familiar with this, you're probably saying, yep, yep, yep. And for people who are new to this, you're probably saying, boy, there's a lot of kind of making all the parts work together, and I would say that's absolutely true. Um, but none of it's all that difficult, and it obviously gets much easier once you've uh, done it for a while and you sort of know where all the uh, various components are, are stored. Um, but once it's done, it's really powerful, and you can do some really cool things with it. Um, so uh, one little tip I wanted to show you, um, one, one thing that happens sometimes is people want to see what the content when they're building a, uh, an SQL statement, and one of the things you can do using the data viewer is you can come in here and you can select the uh, inner component of the, of the execute SQL and then evaluate it. It'll actually show you in English what all these inputs are doing. So we have a, a select, a sum of the return for Mercury sales, which is our data warehouse where the size is 0.5, the year is 200, 2015, and then we're grouping it by months. And uh, distinct, which I talked about, and group by are very, very similar. Uh, the group by says, hey, for every value you find that's in the same month, I want you to summarize it. And as you know, that's something that's not as easy to do in FileMaker and, and in a dynamic way. You can use summary fields. They're a little hard to work with, whereas this is extremely fast and very powerful. So that is the pivot table, and I want to now move on to some other techniques that we can show you. And again, these, these uh, sample files will be available so you can take the time to sort of uh, tear them apart and, and play with them. So we go back to our slides here for a second. So we came back. So I'd 
I'd like to look into the next one, and this is actually a little bit something that older that, that um, I developed for one of our clients originally. Um, and it's the idea of taking a dashboard element and um, allowing us to do our analytics in the dashboard, but then be able to navigate from the dashboard to our specific information. And where this can be really powerful to use an example um, is, for example, visualize that you have um, barcoding or some sort of process that where uh, items are moving through a process and you have barcoding. Well, you can easily record that information and then start to see how long it takes for things to get um, through different elements of your process. Um, it's great for analyzing, for example, bottlenecks. Uh, it, why am I seeing so much stuff in a particular department? It shouldn't be. And if we can drill into it and actually take a look at the data, it may give us some insight. It may tell us that we have, for example, the wrong resource allocations, um, and it's causing our whole process to, to back up. Something that is, is well known in in manufacturing circles, but a process is only as fast as its slowest point. So you might have a lot of departments that can manage their stuff very quickly, but if you have one that's slow, it basically slows down the entire process. So part of the analytics that we're talking about here is to help us find those and again use creative problem solving to get to them. So I'm going to again go back into our file maker and I'm going to change from, from our uh, pivot table and I'm going to look instead at, uh-oh, oh, I didn't mean to do that, so I'm going to bring it back. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to uh, go from there, and I'm actually going to go into a different section of our data warehouse here, and I'm going to look at a thing called um, our project status. So what we have here is completely different information. It actually comes from a different data warehouse, um, but this is a whole bunch of project information that's telling us where are things in my process. So I have a, a several different departments. I've got quality assurance. I've got active projects which clearly haven't been defined. I've got stuff I've already delivered. I've got stuff that's in design and in production. And what this allows me to do is very quickly see these. Now, what you would obviously do if you're doing this for KPIs is you'd set standards for all these things. So you'd be able to quickly identify and you could actually have this showing gaps such as here are all the process, here are all the projects that are in these areas that are past their uh, date due. And um, that type of thing would be much more valuable. But to be honest with you, it's a little hard to simulate that data. Um, but you can imagine in a real life situation, that's what you'd be doing. Instead of showing the raw data, you'd be showing the gaps. You'd be showing things that are not meeting, you know, complying with your uh, expected. And then what you'd do is you'd take one of these areas and you'd say, okay, I'm going to go drill into it. So I'm going to say, take a thing like quality assurance 32. So I come over here. And the technique we've used here, by the way, is, is pretty simple I'll, before I drill in. There's nothing more than a container field here and conditional formatting. So by the graphing engine always um, builds its tables in the same order. So you can actually come in here and um, identify each of the different colors um, and then you simply, and you can accept up to 12 colors and then it does nothing more than um, uh, map the colors. So we use the uh, custom color with the with the eyeglass, uh, the what's it called, the dropper, um, to select the different colors, and then we were able to put that in in the conditional formatting, and then when it draws that to the menu, it matches. So you have the visual reference, and then what's going on in the background here is nothing more than there is a navigation table that's being populated by again an SQL statement. Uh, no surprises there. And all it has is it has the dynamic links to the data that are related to each of our uh, different panels. So I'm, again, I'm going to go back into, say, the quality assurance. That's our brown. I go into that. And here we immediately have access to our data. And again, this is all fictitious data. So, um, But imagine that you had really powerful information in here, and you could sort of see start dates, end dates, um, uh, why it's you know late notes all sorts of different things and then you can furthermore using the new pop-ups that are available you can do things like have a drill in and you'll notice that I'm doing this all without jumping around without leaving the layout without going anywhere else I'm I'm providing tremendous access to my underlying data and I think this is one of the areas where you start to get data warehouses and dashboards actually linked up to your live data and that's where you have, I think, the real opportunity to start to do creative problem solving. 
so this is a, a little bit of a simple technique. The, uh, the What drives this is just, again, one script. And essentially what happens in here is uh, navigate, well, select the status data. So essentially this, this is, I'm using a little bit different. I, I created this, as I say, a little while ago. And instead of going directly, I'm actually uh, populating some, uh, some global fields, but I could have used a, 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 um, var variables. Um, and then it eventually comes down and it goes to a nav layout. So this does a little bit of jumping around, which again is not entirely necessary, but at the time I did this, this was the technique. And then it simply goes and it sets, it, go, it loops through all of my data and sets the correct interval, giving me the information and a reference number that gives me the correct um, uh, navigation to the actual data. So it's really pretty simple. And then when I, when I want to actually go to the data, I simply pass up that information, open a viewer window, find the relevant data, position the window correctly, and, and have all the data sitting there. And again, this is somewhat of a, a superficial treatment, but I think it gives you an idea of, of what, what is uh, possible. So that's a technique number two that I want to show you. And again, this will be in the, in the demo files. Um, so you'll be able to sort of tear this apart and see how you could make this work in, in your applications. And I'll head back now to the, to the keynote. And I'll go into my third example, which is getting a little bit more, if you remember that graph, we're getting a little bit more to the right-hand side of the graph, which is we're going to start talking a little bit more, more about trending and looking a little bit more into the future. Uh, which I think is very important and is certainly as you get more experience with KPIs and dashboards, you can sort of move in that direction. I know that's what I'm interested in doing in our business and it's a little bit of a learning curve getting used to this whole uh, way of approaching your information, but when you get really experienced at it, you can sort of see where doing more forecasting starts to become extremely valuable. So what we're going to look at is a, a concept called earned value. And the idea behind earned value, which is extremely, for those of us who are developers, extremely important, which is saying, okay, uh, we, let's just say we have a project we're working on and there's 30 tasks that need to be accomplished to complete the project. What we're interested in doing is comparing our completion of the task with the amount of effort we've done. So we may have, for example, spent, we may have completed six hours worth of tasks, but it only took us three hours of effort to do. And so our, currently our project is looking good. And, and for those of us in the development world, as you know, keeping that stuff on track throughout the whole project is one of the real challenges and, and opportunities in our business. Um, it's especially a helpful tool in any form of project management, whether it be software development or any other type of, of either creative or other type of project. Um, and how it works is, is really on two things. You, you have a formula that says, based on what do I know now, what would be the total hours? And then there's a second tool which we'll show you, which is adding trend lines to that information. So you can sort of see, well, okay, if this is what I'm doing now, what is that going to look like by the time the project project is finished? Um, uh, the, the, the process of comparing project information to the completion is really a, a very simple process of saying, what are the total hours? what percent complete am I and what percent um, of my effort have I spent? By comparing those and doing a little bit of math on those, you can project what the current view is of our future completion. Um, adding a trend line to that gives us another layer to be able to look at that. And so let's take a look at that and see, see what we've got. So I'm going to go back to FileMaker. I'm actually going to minimize some stuff here. over to our trend lines and I'll minimize this as well, keep it from being too cluttered. So here we have a, a very simple project and what, let me tell you a little bit about this. So what I have here is I have a very simple uh, project that's set up and it's, it's very basic. My, my data warehouse is pretty simple um, and essentially I've got a 10 week project. I have a series of planned tasks and how many hours they're supposed to take per week. I have how many I've actually completed so far and I and I by week and then I also have how much time did I spend now if you look at this particular case they're all the same our planned are completed and our worked are all the same it's all projecting 220 hours and if you sum up this total you'll see it's 220 hours so when we go to the graph 
you'll see that what I is is exactly that. I basically have my hours worked, my hours completed are identical. Now when I go to graph number two and I look at that, I see my total um, my total uh, budget is 220. I'm on a straight line according to my, and there's absolutely no variances involved with what I'm trying to do. And when I come to my graph number three, which is actually a real test, my trend line, my budget, my projected, my hours work, they're all just completely lining up. And what this tells us is that when my data is the same, all of these predictive tools essentially are predicting accurately. So it's a bit of a, of a test of concept. So when we come back in here, go to graph number one, uh, let's, what happens if instead of it everything being perfect, which is scenario one, we start to have some variance. So now we're measuring our hours and we have our hours work, which has got an X and our completed, which has the circle. And we see that it looks like my completed is a little bit under. It's been over in places, but it's really hard to tell kind of what's going on here and where that's going. So one step up from here might be to say, well, why don't I take my cumulative um, total of what I have budgeted, of what I've completed and what I have uh, spent my effort um, and compare them. So I now have that and I'm starting to get that and I can see I'm going up to my line but I don't really have a really good sense of, of kind of where this is, this is definitely headed. So if I go to graph number three, I start to get into my predictive analytics and what this starts to do is that these are the projections of the total um, uh, project using that technique, which is comparing percent complete to percent effort um, and projecting that against the total budget for the project. What you can start to see here is that it's changing every week. So once again, it's a little hard to get a, a grasp. And again, this is simulated data. Um, so in real life, this might be uh, sig significantly more jagged than it is here. Um, but you're starting to get a sense of where this is going. And so what we do is we use a, a, a technique called uh, least squares, which is basically tells me that for each of the projections, um, run the math and give me a line that most accurately predicts what is going on here. Now, least squares uh, techniques tend to be very strong in terms of seeing a jagged line and saying, well, what's the trend line through it? But you have to be aware that they can be affected by things like seasonality and other things. So it's a very powerful technique, but it's a technique that you want to use with some understanding to make sure that the line it is trending for you is accurate. Um, in the case of a project, it's pretty good, though, because we sort of have, uh, in this case, seven weeks of data, and it's able to tell us that we're looking um, that we're uh, looking towards being somewhat above budget by the time we're finished. Um, another thing that, that can be kind of interesting is to change our data and see how it affects the lines. So for instance, in this case here, you can see now my trend line has changed quite a bit um, and it's just been by a, a somewhat different be behavior um, in, in the project. My lines are tracking each other fairly closely but things that were looking quite bad, so you might be in here looking at, boy, is th things are going really badly, but then they started to get better. And the cool thing is that because this is a dynamically calculated line, um, what it's doing is it's, it's immediately telling you um, where, where things have changed. So these are, this is a, a really great technique. I've used it, for example, I do a lot of electronics work, and I have to compare uh, different, um, the results of different tests that I'm doing on electrical components. And there's nothing like these lines, because if you do the same math on the same input data and the lines are different, then you know your data is different. So it's, they're actually really uh, powerful. And um, one of the things I learned from, from talking with Luke Rochester um, over the period since DevCon um, is that there are many techniques like this and there are people, as I say, that this is their uh, primary uh, thing that they do in, in life is, is helping people uh, get in touch with these sorts of uh, predictive trending kinds of tools. This is a fairly simple example, but it's still a pretty powerful example and it's one you can quite easily uh, implement in, in FileMaker. Um, so if you want to see the calculate sums, um, there's a, a lot of this stuff is simply just doing the math, you know, just doing uh, column to column math, you know, uh, total projected. Um, one of the things I try and do, by the way, I should have mentioned earlier, is keep any sort of calculations out of the warehouse. You want it just to be raw data for performance. Um, I, you probably could use stored calcs, but I think it's better just to have everything scripted. So this is just doing really very straightforward math. Um, then what it's doing is it's doing an SQL statement, which is extracting a series of different um, uh, 
technical numbers from the data. And this is something, by the way, that you can easily Google. It's, uh, it's very easy to find. And then it goes through and it starts to calculate the slope of the line. And I'm not going to go through this, but this is essentially looking at the difference between where the line is and where it's supposed to be. And there's a series of squaring and, and multiplication. And lo and behold, it comes out with a slope. And then similarly, you can apply that and get an intercept. So again, this is something that will be in the, in the demo files, and so you can go and uh, dissect that to your heart's content. Again, it's available on Google. So, so this is a, a third technique. I think it's quite powerful. And again, imagine applying this in real life situations to your KPIs, so you start to get real analytics about how things are performing. So we're back in our slides. Go to our next slide. So what have we covered today? Um, essentially, I've gone through a lot of information at a pretty top line level. Uh, but that was my purpose, because I wanted to give people an overview to this topic, not to give them the last final word, because as I say, you could spend a lifetime doing that. Um, the things to remember about KPIs is that they are about relevance and importance, and I probably should have added to the slide, and they're also measured. These are actually numeric values that you want to capture. Ideally, you want them to be shared across the organization with each different component of the organization providing their piece of the puzzle. Um, dashboards are enormously valuable, and I've shown three different techniques that you could apply to this. I would say that if you could use those techniques and apply them to your operations in various ways, I think you could find some real value and analytic quality from that. Um, and I hope it's obvious. I'm certainly a big fan of it myself uh, for using FileMaker as a wonderful tool. Uh, as I said, I use it for analyzing electrical components. Uh, we do this sort of work with a number of different clients, and it's, uh, it's enormously powerful and valuable. I also did want to give a shout out to Luke Rochester. Uh, he was very helpful in, in guiding me through some of the preparation and thinking about this. Uh, he has been working very hard on a, on a tool called One Business App. Um, he, um, he's, in, he's an Australian, but he's living currently in Europe. And he has uh, developed this tool. And you'll see a lot of the predictive modeling and different things that we have talked about are actually in, um, in his system. Um, and it runs on all of the different FileMaker platforms. So it's on the desk, on laptops, and um, the phone, and the iPad, which is obviously a great opportunity. Uh, so he has, um, he's very keen. If you want to get uh, a look at it, um, the onebusinessapp.com is his location. And uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, reach out to you. He did ask, um, if, you, if anyone does want to contact him, if you could mention this webinar, he'd appreciate it because he'd love to see kind of how he can reach out to people effectively because uh, obviously he's spent a lot of time and energy, um, you know, trying to develop this and would love to learn more about the best way to reach people. So thank you. And Tim, I'm going to hand it back, back to you. And um, that's all I got. Thank you very much, John. That was wonderful. I'd like to point our attendees to the control panel for the webinar. There's a section there called questions. If you have any questions for John, now is your time to go there and enter those questions. And I will try to ask him those questions right now at the end of the webinar. So the question section in your control panel. Um, the number one question we have coming in, John, is will these slides be available for downloading and can I see the recording? Um, I'll go ahead and answer for you while you catch your breath. Of course, all the slides will be available in a PDF along with the demo files, and we will be placing a video of this session on YouTube in the FM Academy channel. Just go to YouTube and search FM Academy, and there you can also see all the past presentations, including the past webinar on dashboard building, which was done by one of our partners, Mainspring, long ago, one of the very first FM Academy videos ever done. The next question we have, John, is we have a user, Jeff. He would like to know more about the data warehouse and how it is constructed and what's your strategy for the data snapshot? Yeah, it's a great uh, question. So um, in the past, we've built data warehouses from various sources. Um, and something to be aware of um, from a performance standpoint is that data warehouses can be uh, assembled from varying levels of um, aggregation. So for example, you might have a data warehouse that is built from data that's already highly, highly processed and aggregated. Or you might have a data warehouse that's built from very raw data. So when you think of the source of the data, that's one of the questions. Uh, 
A second thing to consider uh, when building your data warehouse source is that um, obviously it can be FileMaker, which is the source, and it, so you might actually have a process that runs at night. Um, you could even have a process that runs dynamically. For example, when someone saves a new invoice, it automatically updates the data warehouse with that information. Um, uh, or you could have, as I say, a nighttime process that goes and stores that information. And again, that information might be being stored in a fairly raw form, or it might be processed quite a bit, so that when you actually come to present the data, it's already pre presenting information that has been pre-processed and therefore will perform more, more rapidly. The follow-up question to that asked by Peter is, would you recommend using a data warehouse table always, or would you ever use this technique to tie directly to your live tables? I would you I would use a warehouse always. I, with with the power of nighttime processing and, and, and for most of this stuff, the stuff, the day before is plenty. Um, or you can do the dynamic. I think it's better. First of all, it takes some of the load off of the existing tables. Um, third, if, it's a second, if someone makes a mistake, um, then it it you know it's unlikely they're going to damage data, but certainly better they damage the warehouse than the live data. Um, and the third thing I think is really that usually the data you're putting into your warehouse is somewhat aggregated. It's not just raw records. And so I think for performance reasons, it's superior. Um, the other thing to remember also is that there can be normalization issues. And also you do run into situations where the data warehouse actually comes from multiple sources. So for instance, certain of those columns I showed you are coming from FileMaker. Certain other ones are coming from a uh, a corporate database, enterprise database, which is maybe a query that's downloading, and other things might be coming in from even more dynamic sources that are specifically uh, designed to populate the warehouse. So I would, uh, I would definitely recommend using a warehouse. Okay, I have a follow-up on a data warehouse, and that this is from Stephen, and he wants to know if your data warehouse is two-dimensional or is it three-dimensional with time aspects, i.e. a uh, cube. Yeah, um, the, the, what I was doing is primarily uh, two-dimensional, uh, but it, you, you do have the ability to build it into a three-dimensional cube. I, I will be honest with you and say I'm less familiar with those techniques, but I do know it's possible. Okay. Megan and Stephen have very similar questions. They want to know what wonderful technology you're using in the background behind FileMaker. Um, like, are you using an SQL server or JavaScript? How are you doing all of this in just FileMaker if it's native FileMaker? It is all native FileMaker. All right. I've done a lot of work in some of those other languages, and so I, I'm pretty familiar with with SQL and stuff from from prior from prior work. And I, I I was the happiest man on earth when they came up with Execute SQL. But everything you saw today is completely 100% native FileMaker. Great, great. Um, well, thank you very much for your help today, John. I think everybody learned a thing, and I think we have a great idea for the next webinar we should do, and that's on data warehouses. We seem to get yes. a lot of questions about that. Um, again, the slides and the video will be up in the next couple of days. Watch our Twitter at Keologic and FM Academy, and watch the FM Academy blog and the Keologic blog for links to the video and downloadable files. John, thank you very much for your time today, and I hope to see everybody at the next FileMaker Academy webinar. Here are all the FileMaker Academy members. If you should have questions or would like help implementing any of this work in your solutions, contact any of these FileMaker Academy members, and we would be happy to assist you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.